OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. Hello, everybody. My name is Ian Summers. I'm a project specialist at OTAN, the Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. I'm going to be your host for this OTAN Tech Talk. The title for this month's OTT is Using High Flex Instruction. Our presenter today is Francisco Pinedo, a, an OTAN subject matter expert. Francisco, go for it. Good. Hello, uh, my name again is Francisco Pinedo, uh, OTAN subject matter expert and also the lead instructor at Soledad Adult School. And it is my great pleasure to be uh, uh, having this uh, OTT about high flex and high flex learning. Uh, so again, we're going to be talking about uh, flexing your instruction with high flex learning using uh, some tips and tricks that we've learned along the way for using high flex learning here at Soledad Adult School, mainly in our ESL program. The agenda is and the objective is to inspire you to reach more students with high flex teaching, which is something that I will be uh, highlighting and emphasizing a lot throughout the presentation that we can reach more students with high flex teaching. Uh, in the agenda, define well, what is high flex teaching? Uh, we'll be looking at some successes in high flex teaching and learning, uh, but also we'll be looking at some barriers. We know there are barriers for high flex learning models, so we'll be uh, looking at those. Uh, I will be sharing with you examples of how I do a high flex class, uh, mainly for my beginning low, well, all of my beginning levels ESL. And then also I'm going to invite you to read more about the uh, high flex learning and other digital uh, learning models through the digital learning guidance document, which I will be talking uh, towards the end of the presentation. So when we talk about digital learning models, so there are three different types of learning models. The first one is distance, where learning happens away from the traditional classroom, including online learning. Example, Teacher and students are in different locations. So if we remember back about four years ago when right before, a um, well, little less than four years ago when we were ready to go to shelter in place, that was an example of distance learning where the teachers was at one location and the students were at another location. Then we have blended learning, which kind of was happening around that time as well, some agencies started before, uh, like us in Soledad, some agencies started a little bit later. With blended is learning that combines in-person and online instruction where the learner has the control over time, place, and pace, referring to the online portion of the instruction. Uh, for example, is we would have two days in class, brick and mortar classroom, which we, we refer to, and one day online using either an LMS system, a learning, ma learning management system such as Canvas or similar. Sometimes students use the other uh, programs that are offered through other vendors. And that would also count as, for example, the day when they work outside of the classroom, but they are still doing the required work. Then more recently, High flex, and it's not very recent, but uh, in adult education, it seems to be more recent when students choose the mode of participation. It could be asynchronous, where students can view materials at any time they choose, but there really isn't a live video lecture. Or synchronous, where students can log in at a set time, view live video lectures and discussions. So uh, we'll be focusing on the last part, the high flex learning, and see how and give you some examples of some of our students, how they connect uh, both synchronous and asynchronous, and they all get the same learning experience. Some of the fundamental pr um, principles and values in high flex learning is, for example, the learner choice. The learner can choose class participation mode that adapts to their schedules. Sometimes we have uh, issues with babysitting and the student can't come to class, but now they're able to fully participate from home or whatever remote location they are, connecting with the actual class here in person and with uh, the instructor. 
It also offers equivalency. Activities in both more modes are equivalent with the same outcomes. So what I mean by that is that all of the activities that I prepare for my students in class will also be able to be access, uh, uh, accessible by students who are not in the classroom. So we use a lot of technology uh, in the classroom. We use a lot of, instead of paper handouts, we now use digital handouts. Uh, we also use a lot of different things like Google Forms, Padlet, and different things that the student can also access it from home and still get the same learning experience. Reusability. Materials shared between modes, for example, paper handouts in class, digital format for students, or both have the digital format. In our district, we are moving away from paper, more digital, so uh, our students know that as well. So they also were moving in that trend as well, so the students know that instead of receiving a paper handout, they'll be getting a digital handout. Either um, they could access it through our LMS system, uh, and in class also, I have the option to send it via email to the students. I usually do both. Accessibility. Learner possesses or develops basic digital literacy skills and have equitable access to participation modes. So I think this one is very important where the student now is, their uh, digital literacy skills are being enhanced because of high flex models. So they could come in the classroom, they could you know, participate from another location, but they will be using technology pretty much in both situations. So there are many benefits to high flex for all stakeholders, most importantly for our students. So our biggest uh, stakeholders and the ones that we cherish the most of our, stu are our, our students, of course, so now we have more course access. Before, we used to have a limit of about 20 students per classroom because of space and because of availability, we did not have many offerings uh, because of, uh, again, lack of space. Now we have increased participation because now we could serve more students than in the brick and mortar uh, classroom. So uh, there's more opportunities for students to join the classroom and not be on waiting list. Uh, this year, it's very minimal, the waiting list that we've had for our ESL program because two of our classes are using the high flex model. So instead of capping out at 20, we are now have one class has 40 and the other one has 42 students that are connecting at about, let's say from those 40, 42, we have about 30, 33 who are either um, participating. Usually it's about a 50-50 mix. So we might have about 15 students in the classroom, maybe about 15 students who connect um, via uh, video. We use Zoom. Uh, that way they're uh, both uh, participating in, in the class. And then we also have a handful of students who will have access to the material can't join the live uh, lectures, but they will have materials, the presentations I upload, the PowerPoints uh, or Google Slides I do upload. The only thing we do not upload are the videos because of bandwidth um, capacity, which I'll be talking a little bit later, both from our district and from the students' um, point. For faculty, we provide built-in alternative to the classroom instruction. We have more multimedia, less paper, and we can be reusing the information each semester. So for example, this semester that's about to start, we just update a few of the uh, links or uh, a few of the activities that we had from the students from last semester, and we're ready to go. Also talking about, like we uh, said before, about the digital learning skills, we're teaching the students how to use the computers for computer-based testing. So they're accessing different activities uh, via our LMS system or in class during the class participation. So they're using the technology skills that they're going to need when they do computer-based testing, either for ESL or for um, HSC program. Uh, also, in our program, we have seen an increased student enrollment. So we have about a 20% student enrollment in the first semester compared to other semesters. So we are actually above pre-pandemic levels 
of uh, attendance because we are enrolling more students. Uh, we are increasing course offerings. So now we have uh, the same class, but it's not capped at 20. Now it's it's unlimited pretty much. In the classroom, we do have a cap of about 20 because again, we have to follow district guidelines and everything, but students can connect um, to our, our video lesson uh, uh, via a Hyflex model. It's unlimited. We can serve as many as we want um, online. Uh, and we're also yielding higher payment points. So we are yielding higher payment points, which is one thing that um, is catching a lot of people's attention is because we are serving more students. So when it comes time to CASAS test, we usually do let them know when the testing will be. And we have a pretty good attendance. So we're able to heal, uh, yield higher payment points in conjunction with the curriculum that we use as well. So here in Soledad Adult School, the way that we offer high flex instruction is uh, synchronous. So the student logs in at 6 p.m. Uh, for whatever class they're in, usually Monday, Tuesday is the beginning, Wednesday, Thursday is the intermediate advanced, and asynchronous. So for the students who can't uh, connect at 6, so they would do uh, asynchronous. So from the, our learning management system, they could view the presentation. Usually it's on a Google slide. Uh, or a PowerPoint, and sometimes we do have a short video to go along with uh, with it that will cover the same content. So the content is going to be relatively the same. The only thing they're really not getting is uh, watching me doing the instruction and also the the uh, activities on the board or, or whatnot. So, uh, and they won't be able to participate with the students when we do different types of activities as well. So, but they're getting most of the experience. They're getting the lecture, they're getting the objectives, uh, they're getting all that in uh, if they do asynchronous. Most of our students for, except for two in my beginning class are uh, doing, uh, who are using the, uh, are doing the synchronous model. So they could do connect at six, and then we're able to have them online and then also here in the classroom uh, have students. We use the OWL camera, which is a 360 degree camera in the classroom that has a speaker and it has a uh, 360 camera. So when the student in the classroom is speaking, for example, or reading something, the camera focuses on that student and then the student from home is able to see who's actually reading. And then also from home, students usually do connect with their video on. Again, that's something you have to check with your uh, agencies as each agency does have a particular uh, rule about having cameras on or off. Our district is pretty flexible. So if the student opts to have it on, they can or they can remain off. Uh, so then the student is able to participate who's online with the student who is in the classroom. Uh, also for reading activities, the, sp the speaker in the classroom could hear, uh, is very nice and clear. So the student who's connected uh, online is able to, for example, read their sentences, read their ideas, and everybody in the classroom is able to hear them. So uh, it's a device that we use. I know agencies use other things. Uh, some of them have wall-mounted uh, video, whole uh, elaborate system. We just use an OWL camera that has, uh, and we are looking at other options as well, but for now, an OWL camera seems to work well. Students in the classroom uh, are connected via Zoom as well. That way they could interact with the students who are not in the classroom. Uh, so that way they are, everybody's connected. So in a few slides, I'll show you some examples of how that works here in my uh, classroom. But students are connected via Zoom. That way, whenever there's an activity to share, I could just put it in the uh, chat box and it would prompt them to open a link, for example, if we're doing a Padlet activity, or if I want to refer them to a website, I usually just pop it in the chat, pops up on their screen, they're able to open it and we're able to do that um, reading activity. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention before is for students who are having difficulty with using so much technology, we do have technology drop-in days on Fridays. We used to have them more regularly on Fridays. Now it's as requested. So the students know if they need any type of 
help with technology, they could uh, contact me or the other instructor, and we could set up a time for them to go over, for example, Zoom and how to connect or how to access um, the LMS system. So it's not that we just sign up the student and say, okay, you're gonna be uh, in a high, high flex class, but you're only gonna participate uh, online. Good luck. No, we actually do sit down with students who need that help as well. I know, again, uh, some agencies might not have that capability, but in our agency, we do. And again, some agencies that I have seen use Zoom, like my agency, or a similar video conferencing program to deliver instruction. Again, it does not have to be Zoom. It could be any other type of uh, video conferencing program. Procedures for the ESL, and again, I'm focusing on ESL because that is our um, first program that we are piloting the high flex. Uh, we've been piloting it for about a year and a half now. Uh, and we will plan to extend also to our HSC in the near future. So students will have the Zoom link that will be used. It's gonna be the same Zoom link for the whole semester. Uh, I email it to them. I post it in our LMS system in Canvas. Uh, here in the classroom, I have it posted throughout the classroom. And so the students, you know, I encourage them to write it in their notebook or on their phone. And so everybody has the Zoom link that will be used. And students can access the day's agenda in Canvas. And it also has all of the links to the tasks that we will do. That way, the student who is synchronous and asynchronous can see all the activities that is going to be done. We also have the objective of the day, standards that are being met. So that way, the student knows that what they're going to do uh, prior to the actual class. Uh, we do select apps that we're going to use in a, about a week in anticipation. That way the student can install it from home. For example, Nearpod, uh, our tablets here in the school, our iPads have Nearpod, uh, Google Sheets, for example. So uh, a chat GPT, which is a, a newer one we're, we're starting to um, use in the classroom. So we let the student know in advance what apps they are going to need. That way they uh, install it. And for us at the agency site, we usually select which apps, websites we're going to use, let our IT department know that way they could either be accessed through our tablets or installed in our tablets. So there's sometimes uh, websites that we use are blocked through the general school's uh, firewall, but they're able to send, let our iPads use it if I give them uh, uh, about a week or two notice of the sites that we're going to use to use. Uh, and stay consistent with the apps or the sites that will be used, because if all of a sudden we have this list of uh, apps and websites, and then all of a sudden I throw in a new one, some of the students would have to download. We do know some students they have limited availability of data or storage on their device. So we are aware of that. So that's why we kind of choose maybe two apps and a few websites that we're going to be using throughout most of the, the quarter or the semester. And also check that the work, the links work across all devices. We kind of found that out the hard way. Uh, make sure that they work for a operate any operating uh, system and also any mobile device. And we want to make sure that we use work that is ADA compliant, just to follow the um, the American with Disabilities Act. So we always make sure that the links are accessible that whatever we, we do share with our student is accessible for everyone and for every device. But also HyFlex does have many challenges. We talked a little bit about some of the uh, successes that the students have, uh, and then we'll see a little bit more, but there's also some challenges that come with HyFlex. Lack of technology, uh, skills for students. So I kind of addressed that one previously. So again, we do have drop-in days for technology. We also work very closely with a local nonprofit organization here in Monterey County that offers uh, technology training for students uh, on weekends. Also, some of our adult schools offer uh, technology skills uh, with that same agency. Uh, also, they do provide students with low income, uh, if they're low income, uh, with uh, devices, mainly Chromebooks, that either student could purchase at a very low cost or if they participate in one of their workshops, it's even for free. Uh, also, this agency helps students uh, connect to low cost internet service providers. 
uh, because we also know that also lack of connectivity is a problem. Uh, and that's why we want to make sure that the students have access to internet, knowing that some of them might have low bandwidth. So when we choose activities, we make sure that our activities are low bandwidth. So instead of sending the students a 15, 20 minute video, we might cut it up to maybe just a two or three minute video on the main parts that we want them to, um, to focus on. Also, some of the websites, we make sure that they're not very um, content heavy with multimedia because again, that might be a, uh, a issue with some of the students. And some of our students as well also have no internet. So that is when we, uh, here at the school and also with, with the nonprofit, we do refer them to the Broadband for All initiative. So here in California, so they are able to, um, we give them the link and then we also can help them fill out the application to get affordable uh low cost internet. It's very uh, simple to use, uh, just a few questions. And most of the time the students do get a credit of for their um, for their internet. So that right there is some of the ways that we help uh, address those barriers to not having the technology. And also one of the other barriers is that there is no uh, on the spot troubleshoot for technology problems. We all encounter technology problems. I've encountered them in presentations in the classroom. Um, when our students do, sometimes they are able to solve the issues, but a lot of them are not. So that kind of seems to discourage some of the students if, um, and we found out this more when we were using activities that um, were only like flash enabled, for example. So we moved away from that. So now, if it's a it used to be a flash video, now it's uh, that component or website has a different video that maybe is a YouTube video that is accessible to the students. So that is why we troubleshoot links, videos, multimedia that we send. That way we kind of eliminate those um, problems for our students. So, uh, and we do know that there's many more. There are many more uh, challenges, but these seem to be the top ones that our students do um, let us know that are some of the challenges for them. But we also have successes, and that's what we like to focus on. So students take control of their learning. So we always want our students to be independent, lifelong learners. And in a high flex model, the students, especially if they are not in the classroom, a student is taking control of their learning. They could choose, I'm going to go in person this day, or I'm going to connect on this day. And they know that they're going to get the same or pretty much the same. I, I mean, it, it's not going to be 100% the exact same, but you're going to be like up in the 90% um, of similarity between in class and not in the classroom. So, but students do take control. Uh, I seen some students who work in the afternoon uh, do log in to our uh, Canvas, into their Canvas accounts at two, three in the morning when they're on break or when they get off of work and they're doing the work and submitting that work at that time. So it's uh, they're taking control of their learning. Again, as we said, it promotes digital literacy skills that they're going to need when they uh, apply for a job or at their job, for example. And these are soft skills that can be used outside of the classroom, these technology skills. I mean, anywhere our students go now and we go, we have to use technology to some extent. Uh, we also prepare students for post-secondary education. Our community college does use Canvas as a learning management system. So by us using Canvas in the classroom, we are already preparing our student for that next level and one less barrier for them. Uh, again, and we empower the students so they get enough skills, technology skills, to start small online businesses. We've had two students this um, this year so far who learned enough technology skills and who learn how to do different things on the computers with activities that we do, that now they are actually have started their own small, again, I want to emphasize small online business, but again, it's just empowering that student that with the technology skills that they learn and they are using in our classrooms, that they get those skills that help them take it outside the classroom and 
into the workplace or like in this case where students are actually uh, know how to use the computer to promote their business, to take, uh, for example, using um, Google Forms for orders and things like that. So those are some of the things that the students learned in the classroom and then they adapted it to start their own uh, small business. So this is a picture of the classroom I am in currently. This is my classroom. So here you could see the setup. So usually I'm standing here in right in front of the board and between the owl camera. So I kind of pointed an arrow, a red arrow to the owl camera. So you could see the camera is then connected to my uh, laptop. And then from there, it's projected onto the uh, screen we have here on, in the classroom and also the students. So you can see that pretty much we're all on the same page because the students are connected on Zoom. And here you can't really see it because I have a timer, but there the students could see the students who are connected uh, remotely. So that way, all of us are pretty much on the same page, no pun intended, but we are on the same page because we are all able to see exactly the same thing I'm displaying to them. So uh, sometimes with distance learning, students get lost. They don't know what page I'm talking about. This way, I'm able to project it via Zoom to them and they're able to see. And if they have the tech, they have the textbook as well. They can also follow uh, in their textbook. So you can see the students are usually in pairs. Uh, and then the student online as well. So when we do breakout activities, this is an in-person quote unquote breakout activity. Then online, I put the students in different breakouts as well. And I'm able to go in from group to group to see and um, what the students are doing and how they are participating in the classroom. Uh, again, here is another example. So it, especially with this group here, I focused in because here it's a group, it was an activity for uh, groups of three. So here you could see there was two students. So these two students are actually interacting with one. So in this situation, what I did, because again, we're a fairly small class. So I was able to customize the um, breakout rooms and put these two students and also a virtual student. That way they're in a group of three and they're able to collaborate. I do recommend them. They didn't have them that day. Um, we, I'm sorry, we do have, um, uh, headphones, but that day they were getting, um, we were getting new ones, so they didn't have access to them. But usually the student does have a headphone with a mic device as well. So, uh, and we do encourage them to bring their own as well. So this is how the students would collaborate with the students in the classroom and also the students who are not in the classroom. Uh, and again, it, it creates that classroom environment where students know their classmates the ones who are in person and the ones who are um, virtual. And for example, when we have um, celebrations like in, in the fall, uh, the students who connect only online come into the classroom and everybody's like, wow, like you're, you're my partner, you're so-and-so. And it's so nice to physically see you instead of just on the camera. So it's really nice to see how even in an online virtual setting, high flex setting, uh, the students, you know, still recognize each other. And they're, it's like if they were all in the classroom and they all get the same experience. And I invite you to also look at the chapter four and chapter five of the digital learning guidance, where it does have a lot more examples on how to implement and how to start a high flex uh, program. So let me bring... Uh, again, so you would visit the OTAN website. So on the upper right-hand corner, usually the first link, you would see the digital learning guidance. And then from there, you could see that you do have the, the PDF. So you could download the whole document, which is about 120 some odd pages. Or if you want to specifically focus on chapters, for example, I did mention chapter four and chapter five. So these are the two chapters in the digital learning guidance that will give you more examples of blended learning. So I do invite you to, if this is something of your interest, to really look at the guidance document and here it will talk a little bit more, uh, give you a lot more insight of, of how to um, 
be able to to do this type of of learning. So with that, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Francisco, for that informative presentation. I'd like to encourage viewers and everybody else at this time to subscribe to OTAN's YouTube channel, where instructional tech videos related to adult education can be found, including OTAN Tech Talks, just like this one. All this information and more is available on the OTAN website at www.otan.us. Thanks again for watching this OTAN Tech Talk. We'll see you next time.